again, Nightmare Society, and Happy New Year. Boy, am I glad it's a new year. It was nice to have a bit of a break. We visited some family in Michigan, celebrated my birthday this weekend, and uh, just relaxed a little bit. But now we're back. Back with some true horror stories. And these are truly terrible encounters with a stranger who had ill intent, a break-in, a stalker, an inhumane human being. We have user help creepy landlady, user Jinnicky, and user Methhead Jerry to thank for sharing their stories with us tonight. A big thanks also goes to the members of our online campfire over at Patreon for keeping the fire stoked throughout the holidays. They help keep this podcast going and it's much appreciated. Now, get comfy and prepare yourself for another episode of The Nightmare Society. Just to give some context, I'm currently in the UK, and the town where I live is known for its drug scene, but it doesn't have a violent crime problem to speak of. I think that's why I found what happened so shocking, because I lived in London before, and while some messed up stuff did happen to me there, it was nowhere near the level of what happened to me earlier this year. My partner and I lived together in our flat, which is in a relatively busy residential area. I work from home, however, and he's out of the flat quite a lot, so I guess it might look to an outsider like I live alone. Our flat complex was once an old factory, and we have these huge industrial windows, so people walking on the street have a pretty clear view of our dining room which is where I work during the day. It all started in July of last year. I'm ashamed to say that I can be a major rubbernecker and a lot of drama occurs on the side of the road outside of our flat. So I look out of the windows often during my workday for some light entertainment. The best was a two hour breakup I got to watch unfold in the car just below our window, but that's besides the point. One day, I got up to make myself a cup of tea, looked out of the kitchen window and saw this guy just staring at me. I was struck by how intense it was and how he didn't look away, even when it was obvious that I was looking back at him. I felt completely creeped out, but I tried not to let it bother me. We have a lot of drug addicts and other weird characters that hang out around here so it didn't seem like such a big deal. I went back to work, and by the time I'd sat down at the table, he was gone. About a week later, my partner had gone to visit his dad for the weekend, so I was excited to hunker down and catch up on some of my favorite shows alone. After about 30 minutes, the buzzer to the flat went. The buzzer is so loud, and it scared the heck out of me. I was lucky my popcorn didn't go flying out of my hands. Now our flat complex has this big porch where teenagers and drug addicts love to hang out because it provides shelter from the rain and about four people can sit down inside of it. Sometimes people lean up on the buzzers by accident when they're hanging out on the porch so I assumed that was what happened. After a few seconds however the buzzer went again and again and again. Someone was pressing it in this rhythmic pattern. It's something I know my partner does when he's forgotten his keys and it's kind of our code for me to let him in, which is why I found it so disconcerting. At first, I was worried he might have missed the bus to his dad's house and decided to come back to the flat. I was nearly about to buzz him straight in when I thought it would be a good idea to pick up the phone first and check who it was. As soon as I picked up the phone, the person standing near the intercom must have heard, because they said, Hello? It was definitely not my partner. 
I asked who it was and why they were buzzing the flat so late at night. But all they said was, Can you let me in? I asked them why they wanted to come in and they said, You invited me, remember? While they were talking, they kept kind of laughing under their breath. And the whole exchange put me on edge. I told them I had no idea who they were and just hung up. I was half expecting them to start pressing the buzzer again, but they didn't. After a few minutes, I crept out of the flat to have a look at who was on the porch, but they were long gone. My partner has to get up early for work, whereas I'm more of a night owl. Most nights I'm up until around 2 or 3 a.m. working on my laptop while he's asleep. A few nights after the intercom incident, I was on my laptop watching YouTube videos and I realized that we'd forgotten to take the trash out. This happens a lot, and it's not uncommon for me to take the trash out around 1 or 2 a.m. At least it wasn't until all this happened. I put my slippers on, grabbed the bag of trash, and took it out to the curb outside the flat's main entrance. When I looked across the street, there was this guy standing on the opposite street corner. He was watching me, and his eyes followed me all the way from the front door to the curb. I noticed he was smoking, so I assumed he lived in one of the houses across the street. I remember even thinking, wouldn't it be creepy if he tried to come over here? As I put the trash bag down, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw him walking in a straight line across the road towards me, with his eyes fixed on me the entire time. I don't know how to describe it, but... The look on his face filled me with this instinctive sense of dread. It felt like someone had just turned my stomach inside out. I pulled my keys out of my hoodie pocket, turned around, and ran to the front door. I've never felt that kind of fear before, and Stay it was like my body was compelling me to get as far away from this man as possible. I got into the building, slammed the door behind me, and rushed to my flat without looking back. I didn't want to know whether he'd followed me or not. I told my partner about the whole thing the next day and how shook up I was. We agreed that we'd be more proactive with the trash and I'd never take it out again late again at night. Fast forward to the beginning of August about two weeks after the trash incident. I had pretty much forgotten all about it. I was too scared to go out late at night on the road but nothing weird had happened to me since then. I went to bed at about 2 a.m., but I felt restless for some reason and I struggled to get to sleep. By about 3 a.m., I was contemplating whether or not to give up and go do something else when I heard this scream. <coughs> the sound cut right through me. There was something visceral about the terror in that scream. I knew it was bad because my partner went from stone cold asleep to being up in a shot. He asked me what it was and I said I didn't know. I went to the window straight away and looked out. Down one of the side roads near our flat I could see headlights, but I couldn't get a clearer view of the car. The screaming continued in bursts and after a while I could make out words. It was a woman and she was screaming, get out, over and over again. I'm used to hearing all kinds of domestic arguments take place on the road outside our flat particularly since we are near the university and several popular bars. But this was different. There was this raw fear in her voice that made the hairs on my arms stand up. I turned to my partner and I said I had to call the police. When they picked up, I explained what was happening. They seemed disinterested at first. But the operator's tone changed when I told them where it was. I think they must have been getting calls from all around the area about it. It was something during this phone call that I heard a screech of tires and the screaming stopped. The operator asked me to go to the window and describe to them what was happening. When I looked down, there was this black car sat in the road. One of the neighbors from across the road was speaking to two guys in the car. I had to twist to get a good look at them, but none of the guys in the car looked uncannily like the guy who had been watching me when I was putting out the trash that time. At first, the conversation seemed congenial, but it took a turn when the neighbor asked some sort of question that I couldn't hear clearly, and they sped off down the road. 
Within no less than 10 minutes, three police cars arrived and had blocked off the roads leading to our flat. Our residential area is on a grid system. They were knocking on doors and asking to speak to all of the neighbors. I told my partner that we should go out and speak to them. Since we saw a lot of what happened, and my partner had the foresight to write down the license plate of the black car. When we went out, there were these two girls talking to one of the police officers. They were both shaking, and one of them looked as though she had been crying. I decided to stand nearby and wait for the girls to finish before speaking with the officer myself. What they said made my blood run cold. They were from one of the houses that looked out directly onto the road where I had seen the headlights, so they had a clear view of what had happened. Like us, they had been alerted by the screaming and gone straight to the window. From what they could gather, the black car had cut off a small red car on the road, like pulled right in front of it, and that's what had caused the girl driving the red car to scream the first time. They thought it might have been some kind of misunderstanding, but then they watched out as one of the guys from the black car got out, walked to the red car, and jumped in through the window. That's the point when the girl must have been screaming, get out, get out. There had been a struggle, and the girls watching said they assumed the guy was just trying to steal the car, but then he forced the driver into the back seat, and that's when he drove off. The two girls were both hysterical by this point, and you could tell they felt guilty for not intervening. I could feel the same guilt seeping into my thoughts as well. After the guy had driven off in the red car, the two men in the black car had gone the opposite way and turned the corner onto our road, but had been stopped by another neighbor. Although this neighbor had been alerted by the screaming, he hadn't actually witnessed what happened. So he had stopped the black car to ask the guys what was going on without knowing they were involved. That was the exchange that I saw. When the guys started acting suspicious, he asked them if they would wait for the police to arrive. And that's the point when they drove off. It wasn't until we got back to the flat that I started to put two and two together. I have a small red car, just like the one that the girls had described. And I normally come back at night on that day of week since it's the day I go visit my parents. I had only come back early on this particular occasion because I needed to let a plumber in to do work in the flat. What if they had been waiting for me, and they got the wrong car? Over the next few days, I contacted the police several times and checked the local news, but I never heard anything about the girl who was kidnapped. I still have no idea what happened to her. All I know is that they found her car abandoned somewhere not far from where she was taken, but she was not in it. Still gives me the chills just thinking about it. If you use Reddit, go give a like to this story post. I've provided the link to it in the episode notes. This happened in college, maybe seven years ago. At the time, I was living with one of my best friends, and we were very into the bar scene and partying and such. We lived in a city that was very much inundated with college kids, so it was never hard to find a party. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but probably every other night I was out partying my butt off. So this story starts on a night very much like every other. She and I got all dressed up and went on a bar crawl. We ended up at this club, it was one of the more popular ones in the area, and we meet up with my ex-roommate. The three of us are having a pretty great night, but periodically we were all interacting with this one guy. None of us remember his name, but he seemed normal enough, just around. He sat next to us on the smoking porch and bummed a cigarette from me. He bought my friend a drink, he was dancing next to us. We even all had a little flippant conversation together, although I can't for the life of me remember what it was about. But he was there, in the periphery, all night. Around 1am, the three of us decide that we're drunk enough and done dancing, and my ex-roommate invites me and the bestie to her place to smoke some grass. None of us have cars at this point, but it's a nice night and she only lives a couple of miles away. So we start walking. 
the downtown streets quickly turn into a semi-residential, semi-warehouse district area. Not the best part of town, or the most populated, but not a bad area by any means, and usually the streets are fully empty. We were maybe about halfway to the house when we noticed there's someone behind us trailing along and getting closer. We really don't think anything of it until we pause to light up some cigarettes, and he catches up and we realize it's the guy who'd been hanging around with us at the bar. He's kind of stumbly, clearly drunk, and he greets us like old friends. We don't want to be rude, but it strikes all of us as kind of weird that he's there to begin with. But we shrug it off because he's drunk and seemingly harmless. I should say right here, he's a real scrawny guy. On the taller side, but thin with a baby face and big, big eyes. He just looks generally harmless and drunk. He asks if he can bum a cigarette and walk with us until he gets to where he's going, which isn't far. He's just pretty drunk and not sure he'll make it. And he's clearly very unsteady in his feet, so we say, sure, why not? So we're walking and chatting and we're getting closer to our destination, but he doesn't make any indication of where he's going. So I finally ask him, So where do you live? And he gives me this funny look like I'd asked him something really stupid and he says, Oh, I don't live anywhere near here. This kind of creeps us all out and we sort of stop where we are. And I'm like, okay, well then where are you going? And he goes, I'm following you. At this point, I think there's been maybe like a misunderstanding in his mind. So I respond with something along the lines of, okay, well no offense, but we don't even know your name. You're not coming with us. And he gets this look, like hurt, but also angry and a little manic. And he gets kind of loud and he says, But I told you all my name. I told each of you my name. How can you not remember my name? And at this point, my ex-roommate steps in and goes, Look, man, I know you're drunk, but you need to calm down. And the guy stops and gets real calm real fast. And he gets this really serious look and he says, No, no, I'm not drunk. I'm fine. I just knew you'd trust me more if you thought I was drunk. At that point, I'm like, hell no, I'm out. But my roommate doesn't believe him, and she says something like, no, you've been stumbling this whole time, of course you're drunk. And he shakes his head, and in a completely calm tone, with no slurring whatsoever, he goes... No, I'm sober. I just wanted to see if you'd let me in the house. And my friend asks why. And the guy gets this huge smile and his big eyes got even wider and he says, I just wanted to see how close I could get to killing you. At that point I had had enough and I put on my authority voice and I tell him that that's enough. And that we're leaving and he needs to go the other freaking direction before I call the cops. He just shrugs and says, fine. And we scurry away and leave him leaning up against the stop sign, just smoking a cigarette and watching us run. As soon as we round the corner, we all break into a dead sprint and a run for the few blocks, then stop and freak out. We're in the middle of a panic whisper huddle when my friend looks over my shoulder and lets out this little scream. We turn around and there he is. It's so dark, so we can't see his face, just his silhouette against the street lamps. But that was enough to know it was definitely him. He's striding down the road a few blocks down, hand in pockets, not a trace of a stumble. And he's not exactly running, but he's walking at this really brisk pace, and he'll be on us in less than a minute. Luckily, we were only about a block away from my friend's place, so we start booking it there. We're almost at the front door when I realize we don't want him to know where we're going. Not the three of us alone. That seems dangerous as heck. Fortune shines on us up the block and I can see the telltale signs of a garage party and we book it over there instead. We come up to the lawn and there's a bunch of dudes out front. 
and we are breathlessly trying to explain ourselves. But when we turn around to point out the guy, he's nowhere to be seen. The partiers sympathize and let us hang for a few hours, and a few of them even walk us back to the house. Thankfully, we never saw him again. And needless to say, my friends and I lost our taste for partying for quite a while after that. So drunk slash not drunk dude, let's never meet again. I used to work as a housekeeper for this company that would assign me to different houses in the area that were hiring. I had this one job at a house that was just a few towns over one night. I was reluctant to go since it was late, but I knew an old back road that would cut the driving time in half. It used to be an old logging road, and there's tons of them in Oregon that can be handy shortcuts to places. One downside was the road was small, windy, and if you got into a crash you'd basically be in the middle of nowhere surrounded by a forest. I'm not sure it was completely legal to drive on either. So anyways, I was driving down this road, groggy and tired, when I felt a small collision on my trunk. I cursed and pulled over to inspect the damage and talked to the driver, who had seemingly come out of nowhere. He pulled up right behind me. I got out and walked over to him and asked if he was okay. I was about three feet from the car and I could see him sitting there, but he wasn't getting out. It was winter and night so everything was pitch black and I could barely see anything. But I knew there was a figure there. It was freezing cold and I was getting creeped out so I told him since there's barely any damage, I was just going to go. As I was heading back to my car, I heard this door open behind me. I turned around and saw him standing there. He was tall and had on a large black coat and baggy jeans. I stepped towards him and noticed something that made my heart sink. His hands were white, but his face was dark. I squinted and realized he was wearing black makeup on his face. This scared me even more because I was thinking he was wearing blackface, and for the record, I'm black. And he had followed me out there in the middle of nowhere to harm me. I turned and started for my car when I felt a cold tip of the gun press against the back of my head. I was ready to cry at this point, thinking I was going to die alone out here because of my skin color. I ended up trying to reason with him but I could barely choke out any words as I told him he didn't have to do this. Something surprising happened. The guy started to cry as well and just jumped in his car and sped off. Maybe I should have tried to see the license plate, but at that moment I just got in my car, drove home, and called my parents. I never ever in my entire life thought I'd narrowly escape from being the victim of what was possibly a hate crime. I'm glad this guy had a change of heart, or whatever you want to call his reasoning for sparing me. Very intense and terrifying. I'm so glad that all of our contributors made it out safely. Don't forget we have an online campfire going on over at patreon.com slash nightmare society. We also have an Instagram at nightmare society radio where we post our updates. Would you rather Fridays and such. Thanks so much for listening and until next time. Sweet.